probably familiar with video game bosses, right? Big health bar, cutscene, music goes all You get it. Well, then you're probably also au fait with the concept of mini-bosses. Special enemies peppered through a game, maybe halfway through a level, who don't get nearly as much fanfare as proper bosses, but who are supposed to gently push your limits before you face a more serious battle later on. <laughs> And we say supposed to, because holy hell, some mini-bosses did not get the memo, and are accidentally more hardcore than 90% of the actual proper bosses you can find in, well, any game. But where the surprisingly savage mini-boss battles, and spoilers for the following games. In a game full of middle fingers to the player, there is perhaps no middle finger larger or more in your face than the fact that the Chained Ogre in Sekiro Shadows Die Twice is not even a proper actual boss fight. In fact, this red-eyed, vocally unhappy gentleman sits squarely in Sekiro's mini-boss category, seeing as he offers the player no cutscene, no special music, and crucially, no attack-boosting memory consumable when defeated. That's not to say he won't live on in your memory, though, for being an absolute cast-iron bastard, or that he has nothing to offer. For instance, do you like the sight of you being picked up and hurled bodily off a cliff? Hope so, because it's going to happen a lot. Being grappled and hurled to your death is just one of the many ways this absurdly strong, surprisingly quick ogre can thrash you, having broken free of the fencing holding him when you approach. Because this mini-boss is encountered very early in the game, the ogre's attacks are likely to polish off your health bar in just one move. And speaking of health bars, he has two. The Chained Ogre is the game's way of telling you to expect the unexpected. Having disciplined you thus far in standing your ground and using perfectly timed sword deflections to master your foes, then making you fight an undead 11 foot high pro wrestler who sees your perfectly timed deflections and raises you being kicked impossibly hard in the face. The other reading of The Chained Ogre is that the game is telling you to give up, at least for now, because if you bail and explore elsewhere, you're likely to find prosthetic tools that make this fight marginally easier, or learn the power of running away and hiding. Which in this fight can cause the ogre to lose sight of you, leading to one easy death blow. Great, now he's literally had half his health removed, so this should be a more fair for- oh, 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 oh no! Are you still there, viewer? All I see is a middle finger in my face. Let's get underway already. And keep Sora away from Kairi, until we're ready to land. Hmm. That scurvy brat thinks he can order me around. What shall we do, Captain Hook? Nothing! The hold is crawling with heartless. Let them keep an eye on the brats. If you're going to Neverland, there's three things you can usually rely on. Peter Pan is there, Tinkerbell will be giving you flying powers, and Captain Hook is the biggest villain on the island. But in Kingdom Hearts, that final thing isn't to be. While Captain Hook is the actual boss of Neverland's Jolly Roger area, he's not the toughest thing you'll be fighting. Why? Because Sora's anime head pal Riku appears and has worked out how to create shadow versions of Sora. <sighs> These shadow Soras turn up everywhere as you fight your way through the labyrinth that is the hull of the Jolly Roger. But the worst shadow Sora of all is the mini boss that Riku conjures up in Captain Hook's cabin, aka Anti Sora, who wields a shadowy keyblade and is a complete pain in the ass to fight. 
Kingdom Hearts as a series is infamous for its optional boss battles that break the spirit of anyone attempting them, but this fight isn't optional and isn't even a main boss. This shitty shadow has three whole health bars that you have to whittle down and some real mean tricks he can play on you. He can split himself into three, the real him and two fakes. So you often waste your time and energy hitting a fake shadow into nothingness, opening you or a teammate up to an attack. But worst of all, Anti-Sora can turn into a flat shadow on the floor. This renders him not only in 2D, but also completely invulnerable, as he zooms around beneath you, often skittering off to the other end of the room. Oi! Come back here with my likeness! Disney isn't fond of IP theft, you know. Worst of all, on his final health bar, when Anti-Sora goes into the floor, you can no longer see him at all. So you lose lock-on, have no idea where he is, and he pops up out of nowhere to hit you. <laughs> Ow! Hey! Just you try that again. Ah. Ow! I didn't mean actually. God. Confined in this tiny space with an unforgiving camera, featuring an enemy that zips about completely invisible and invincible, this fight really drains you. Heck, sometimes it's so hard to land a blow on this thing that his health bar completely times out and disappears from the screen. This stressful enclosed fight against an enemy who can move around much faster than you is vastly in contrast with the level's actual boss fight. With Captain Hook, you can literally fly away from him if you need a breather or to heal up, and this often tricks him into jumping off the side of the boat after you. Come on! Don't see Antisora doing that, because he's invisible half the time. Demonic Presence, Threat Level 5, entering Main Laboratory. We've spoken about the Marauder from Doom Eternal before on Outside Extra, specifically on a list about boss fights we hated. But guess what? Turns out if we're going strictly by the letter of the law, that video was a terrible lie. Because incredibly and outrageously, the Marauder from Doom Eternal isn't even technically one of the game's bosses. The truth is out. God, it feels good to stop living a lie. The Marauder is a horned, armored, axe-wielding nightmare you first encounter in Doom Eternal's Ark Complex stage, and behaves for all the world like a boss. There's no achievement for beating him, however, and he lacks the telltale health bar that Doom Eternal's main boss battles feature prominently. That leaves the Marauder as one of the most diamond-hard mini-bosses ever committed to digital entertainment. The Marauder looks like he weighs as much as a freight train and hits roughly as hard. If you get too close, he'll pummel you with his axe, and at range he's equipped with a shotgun. He also has a shield, and if you make the mistake of shooting that shield, he'll summon a ghost dog to chew your face off. What makes the Marauder such a difficult, infamous and divisive part of Doom's Stable of Hellions is the fact that unlike almost all his cohorts, you need precise timing to beat him. Only when his eyes flash green is he vulnerable, which means fighting him requires waiting for the right moment to blast him in the face. This throws many players for a loop, as up to this point the already difficult Doom Eternal has punished you for ever relenting, waiting or pausing in your demon slaughter rampage. After all, the best time to shoot a demon was the second you saw it, and the second best time is now, right? The fact that a ghost dog is eating me suggests no. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet, eating her curds and whey. Whatever the hell a tuffet is, and whatever the hell curds and whey are.
But Muffet from Undertale prefers to web you in place and send her big, horrible, muffin-shaped pet after you. This pastry-loving spider is infamous for being a mini-boss so tough that many mistake her for a main boss, and even game creator Toby Fox admitted he'd gone overboard on this one, saying, I also think I made Muffet a bit too difficult. She was already nerfed a few times during development, so I thought it was enough, lol. Reader, it was not enough. What makes the Muffet fight so hard? Well, the aforementioned webbing in place means that you can't make a single attack. So if you've been used to beating seven bells out of every monster you meet, you suddenly have to play the game very differently. And even those on a no-attack pacifist playthrough have far fewer options than usual. The only action you can take is to struggle, or bribe Muffet with some of your valuable coins so she'll send fewer things your way in her next attack. Those things being spiders, croissants, and donuts. Two out of three of those things make me hungry. I'll never tell. In order to escape the webbing, you just have to survive, specifically through 17 turns, where a single hit from any of these dozens of arachnid and pastry projectiles knocks off at least one of your measly 20 hit points. The only redeeming feature of this fight is the music, which is some of the best in gaming, let alone this game, so we were at least happy grooving along while getting pummeled with pastries. As a joke at your expense, the game actually provides two ways to make this mini-boss fight trivial, but neither is likely to help you. The first is to have bought a spider donut right at the start of the game and kept it in your inventory up to this point, which, if you eat in front of Muffet, will placate her. The second loophole to dodge this fight is to acquire a different fight-ending pastry at Muffet's very own bake sale a little ways before her webby parlour. These ones, however, cost, sorry, 9,999 gold? How much are you making on these, Muffet? Guess she's a money spider. Boo! I make no apologies. It feels weird featuring just one encounter from Bloodborne on this list, because every enemy in Bloodborne is harder than most bosses in any other game. It's also not entirely clear what should count as a mini-boss in some of From Software's RPGs, when these games are full of unique encounters and more enemy categories than you can shake a stick at. But if descending a well to fight an absurdly difficult enemy to win a special weapon doesn't at least merit mini-boss status, I don't know what does. And folks, what's lurking at the bottom of this particular well is a real doozy. And by doozy we mean enormous shark man. The shark giant is found at the bottom of the well in Bloodborne's Fishing Hamlet, in the rock-hard Old Hunters DLC, and must be fought if you want to acquire the extremely cool Rakuyo weapon. It's a lumbering, barnacle-encrusted foe with an uncanny ability to put its many teeth and claws right where your vital organs are with only half a second's notice. The shark giant's stopping power and unique ability to be back on you before you've found a chance to heal makes it harder to fight than maybe, yeah, I'm gonna say it, most full bosses in Bloodborne. And that's before you factor in that when it gets to half health, the second one drops down from the ceiling. Wow, so cool. If you want a measure of how infamous the shark giant and his terrifying mate who's waiting on the ceiling are within the Bloodborne community, consider the fact that if you look them up on the game's wiki, the very first bullet point under the strategy section is give up. I wish I'd known about this strategy sooner. Another, less advisable strategy is to try and use a precious shaman bone blade item on one of the sharks which, if your timing is sound, will turn it hostile against its friend, letting you sit back and watch them kaiju fight each other to death. The only drawback to this approach being that it's fairly unlikely the sharks will neatly kill each other at the exact same moment, so you will, eventually, be back fighting a bus-sized gargling sea horror. I suggest going back to the previous strategy.
Metroid Dread is not a game that lacks challenge. Whether you're trying to survive one of its blistering boss battles, escape from the relentless Emmy robots that pursue you throughout the game, or just remember which section exactly in this huge ass map that you were at four hours ago when you saw that funny coloured wall you could probably get through now. I want to say it was... Bl Blanaria? Is, is that one of them? It's in one of these regions that you will, progressing through the story, encounter a friendly old bird called Quiet Robe. After hours of arduous questing, it's really something to finally meet a friendly face. It can get awful lonely exploring these long abandoned worlds into a last- Oh, what?! Quiet Robe has been assassinated by a robot Chozo soldier, an AI death dealer that shows up several times after this in the game for mini boss battle ambushes. There's nothing quite so alarming as walking into a room, only to see the doors lock up as one of these gleaming Samus squishers drops into frame. Well, except perhaps for their roster of powerful moves, including a nerve-shredding, day-ruining charge attack and lasers out the wazoo. The robot Chozo soldier is liable to have your heart rate higher and your hands stress gripping the controller more than in most any other game. And these mini-bosses only get more intense as the game goes on. For instance, you've probably noticed there are two of them now. To Bloodborne Metroid Dread, because that's really the last thing we need. This is Calamity Ganon, the final boss of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Described as a pure, enraged embodiment of ancient evil, this building-sized robotic spider Hellspawn is confronted at the climax of Nintendo's sprawling open-world RPG. And if you've played the game as intended and regained control of all four divine beasts, when you face him he will still have an imposing 4,000 hit points. This silver lion horse you find randomly wandering around a field, 5,000 hit points. 7.5 if it's a gold one. This is one of Breath of the Wild's Lynels, the toughest enemies in the game, and yet not classed as bosses. They don't even get a big screen-filling health bar. You have to make do with the standard enemy health bar, and try not to despair when your attacks remove approximately one pixel's width at a time. <laughs> It's likely that many players' first meeting with a Lionel will come during a mission chain for the Zora, who are trying to get their divine beast Varuta back online, for which you need to retrieve shock arrows from popular Zora diving spot, Shatterback Point. You wouldn't think anywhere called Shatterback Point could become a popular diving spot, but I guess the Zora are pretty hardcore. Not as hardcore, however, as the Lionel guarding those arrows, very possibly the most frightening enemy you'll have encountered in the game thus far, unless you've encountered a different Lionel somewhere else. With attacks that hit immensely hard and the ability to shoot you at range, the Lionel miniboss is such a brutal foe, I'm sure I wasn't the only player who opted instead to hide like a coward and creep around in the mud looking for arrows whenever the Lionel's keen eyes were not upon me. On the plus side, the difficulty of beating these hell on hoofs enemies is so high they've become the subject of stunt YouTube videos, where players show off impossibly skilled trick methods of dispatching them without taking a lick of damage, to inspire players to make better use of Breath of the Wild's brilliant physics sandbox. <laughs> nice. I won't be doing that. No one can. I know I've just seen someone do it, but it can't be done. So those are some of the mini-bosses that are just way harder than they should be game. This, this is supposed to like build us up and train us, not tear us down and hurt us. Why are you trying to tear us down? Yeah, why are you doing that, man? It's not cool. Anyway, uh, are there any mini-bosses that actually like ruined your day? Let us know in the comments below. It'd be very cathartic and hey, maybe we'll make a commenter edition of this. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, do always subscribe, give us a thumbs up, always appreciated. You can join our Patreon if you'd like to support us further. And uh, for more things to go watch, have a look over here at some lovely videos that we've made. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. Bye. <sighs>